Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And this is lesson 8 of the pastoral epistles. And uh, pastoral epistles consisting of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Paul's final three letters that he wrote. Now, in, in, in the New Testament, there are they're listed in sequence, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. That is not the sequence in which they were written. 1 Timothy and Titus were written before 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is Paul's final letter that he wrote. And um, in this letter, he knows that he's down towards the end of his life. Now, I want to give you just a little bit of background to 2 Timothy so that we can, when, when we look at, at the words of 2 Timothy, we get a sense of the situation, the circumstances that Paul is in and that Timothy is in. And uh, Paul obviously is in prison when he writes this letter. But this is not the same imprisonment that he expresses in letters like uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. This is not the same imprisonment that we read about in Acts 28, where in Acts 28, the book of Acts ends with Paul um, incarcerated under house arrest in the city of Rome awaiting trial. This is, now you say, well now how do you know this is a different uh, imprisonment? Based on the testimony of early church leaders from uh, late in the first century, in the last decade, in the 90s, and also in the early second century, we, we know from their testimony that this was a second imprisonment. Uh, according to these sources, Paul was brought before Caesar and he was tried, but he was released, according to their testimony, he was released from that first imprisonment. And I have that listed here. Let me just look at my notes here. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, verses 16 and 17. Um, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, it must be. Let's look at this and see if that's the one. No, it's not. I must. Maybe that is a typo. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. No, that's not the one I'm looking for. Uh, but anyway, in this letter, we'll come across it later, uh, Paul talks about how that, uh, that the Lord stood with him. He said that, 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 uh, that when he was brought into this situation, he said, all forsook me, but the Lord stood with me and was with me and delivered me from the mouth of the lion. Now, that is a passage here somewhere. I think it is. It's in one of the, the passages here. I have a, um, I, I, maybe it's 3, 16 and 17. No, it's not it either. That's interesting. It's the one where he says, says I was delivered from the mouth of the lion. Uh, all forsook me, but the Lord stood with me, and he delivered me from the mouth of the lion. So if somebody finds that passage, uh, bring it up. But uh, it is believed that he is referring to him being set free from his first imprisonment. And so being set free from his first imprisonment, he enjoyed a time of freedom. And he traveled to places he had been before like Ephesus. And that's when he left Timothy in Ephesus to deal with the, um, the false teaching that was going on that we dealt with in earlier lessons. Uh, he was in Crete, went to the island of Crete with Titus. He left Titus in Crete. He returned to Rome, and he was arrested a second time in Rome. And it was during this second imprisonment that he wrote his final letter, 2 Timothy. And it's obvious in this letter that things have changed because now he urges Timothy to come to me quickly. Wow. He urges him to leave Ephesus and come to me quickly. And he talks about how he knows that he has finished his course. The time of my departure is at hand. I'm being poured out like a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. So it, it is, it's actually 
uh, perhaps one of his most intimate and most uh, heart-wrenching letters of all that is written. It is very, very powerful. But let me just read him, talking about the background of this, I was going to pull this book off the shelf, but one of the earliest Christian histories was written in the 4th century around the year 330. It was published the first time around the year 330 by a church leader named Eusebius. And in, uh, in Eusebius' church history, here's what he wrote in the 4th century. He said, There is evidence that having been brought to trial the first time, the Apostle Paul again set out on the ministry of preaching and having appeared a second time in the same city of Rome found fulfillment in his martyrdom. In the course of this imprisonment, this second imprisonment, he composed the second epistle to Timothy. Now, so it was uh, during, now let me read another one from Clement of Rome, another church leader and he's writing much earlier than you see this. He's writing in the last decade of the first century. And he wrote this eulogy for Paul uh, after Paul's death. He's writing this about 30 years after Paul's death. So he's much more closer to the situation. He says of Paul, after having been seven times in chains, had been driven into exile, had been stoned, and had preached in the east and in the west. He won the genuine glory for his faith, having taught righteousness to the whole world and having reached the farthest limits of the west. If you take a map and you go from Jerusalem and Rome to the farthest limits of the west, you will come to Spain. And in Romans chapter 15, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, expresses an expectation of them helping him out on his way to Spain. Wow. And so, Paul, 1 Timothy, Paul is free. He's been freed from his first Roman imprisonment. He and Timothy are together. They go back to Ephesus where Paul founded the church there. They find that the church is, is mired down in false teachings, false doctrines, and we dealt with that, what the false doctrine was. He urged Timothy to stay behind. He won, went on into Macedonia. And, uh, and then there were other travels that we don't have an exact chronological uh, 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 story of. But we know from the letter to Titus that he and Titus were ministering on the island of Crete out in the Mediterranean. And he left Titus at Crete sort of in the same way as he left Timothy in Ephesus to help continue the work of the Lord there in Crete. And then he returned to Rome, was arrested a second time. And this time he's in prison. His first imprisonment, uh, he had a lot of freedom. He was under house arrest, had a lot of freedom. That same kind of freedom doesn't seem to be uh, the same in this second imprisonment. And uh, so I want to look at some things here. And um, I'm reading from, uh, Sue, this is the... The, actually, I didn't realize I had this, but we also, we have a, a devotional commentary on 2 Timothy. And so I, I went to it today to draw from this. And so I'm going to read the first few verses and then I'm going to comment on it. And we're going to get to verses 6 and 7 about fanning into flame the gift of God. I'm talking to somebody tonight, you need to fan into flame the gift of God. You've experienced God's presence. You've experienced God's blessing. You've experienced God's power in the past. You have known the call of God, but you have neglected that gift of God, and it has that flame has died down, and um, and there's only some embers, and maybe you're not even aware that the embers are there. Maybe they're under the the ashes and so on, but those embers are still there and can be fanned into a new flame of passion and life and power. So don't go anywhere. We're going to get to that in a moment. But first of all, I want to read the first few verses leading up to that passage in 2 Timothy uh, 1.6. And he begins this letter, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son. 
And uh, the Greek word here is technos. And it's a word that, that referred to a little child. Now, we know that Timothy is not a little child. He's a grown man. But he's much younger than Paul. But this shows Paul's affection for Timothy, that Timothy is like a son to him. To Timothy, a beloved, and it's a word, uh, it's an adjective, agape used as an adjective. A beloved child, a beloved son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. And maybe I need to just back up and say something about this. You know, the, the, the Bible talks about that, you know, there are different images of the church. And it's terrible that we only have, we say church, we have one image. And it's a building, a certain kind of building with a certain kind of architecture, certain time of benches and, and, and uh, platforms and where people get together on Sunday. Well, those things did not exist in the New Testament, that kind of buildings and architecture. The church was people. It was God's people gathered together. And there are different images in the New Testament of church. Uh, uh, it's, it's a sanctuary. It's a temple. It's God's dwelling place. It is a people like an ethnicity. It's even called an ethnicity, a new race of people that God has brought forth. But it's also referred to as a family. And, uh, and you know, and I think that's an emphasis that is needed. It's a family. It's not just some kind of formal thing. And how far so much church today is uh, where people, they go to a meeting once a week and they don't even know the people in front of them and next to them, but they go and they are entertained. But one thing about true church, it's talked about that it's a family and um one thing I love about family, even though I strayed away from the Lord, I grew up, um, my parents weren't, weren't perfect, but anyway, they were good people and uh, they loved their kids, but they certainly wouldn't allow us to bring anything ungodly into the home or anything. But one thing I knew, no matter whatever might happen, if worse came to worse, I always knew I could go home. <laughs> I knew that I would be accepted. I could go home, no matter how far I had strayed or what I had done. Now, I knew I couldn't bring any sin home with me, but I always knew I could go home. And I'll never forget a few years ago, I was very busy. I don't know, maybe I was writing a book. I was very busy. And uh, there was a young woman uh, in, uh, she was from uh, the Scandinavian countries and uh, she was going to be in Dallas, and Sue was connecting with her, and, uh, and Sue had uh, arranged for her to come up and spend several days with us. And um, you know, and I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll confess my sin, I felt irritated. <laughs> this is just going to disrupt my life and my schedule and getting done what I need to get done. And the Lord spoke to me in the night, and he said, Treat her like family and it'll transform her life. Wow. Treat her like family and it'll transform her life. And so, my friends, you know, I think we need to remember that. The church is a family. And we shouldn't treat people like they're, you know, foreigners or strangers. But there is a family that God is raising up all over the world out of every ethnicity, tribe, and tongue, but we're one family in Him, in Christ, in the Spirit. And so uh, I think we were reading last week that Paul told Timothy to treat the older men like fathers, the younger men like brothers, the older women like mothers, and the younger women like sisters. And so there is something to this whole thing that we are a family, the church is a family, and we need to treat one another like family. Now, we read on, verse 3, he says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. When you serve God with a pure conscience, that means that you do not ever violate your internal sense of right and wrong. And when people live according to their conscience, it means that they are honest, sincere, and, and that they are consistent people. And I really believe that if someone lives according to their conscience, if they live in the most repart tribe in, um, in uh, um, what, what was the name of her book from 
Iria Jaya, from Jerusalem to Iria Jaya. I think that's the end of the island of Indonesia. You live in one of the most remote tribes in one of those remote places in Tanzania or whatever it might be. If you live according to your conscience, but the thing is nobody does that because, because self, ego, pride takes over. But, but when people live according to their conscience, I believe that God will get them the revelation of Jesus Christ that they need. And Paul said, I always live according to my conscience. I never violate that internal sense of right and wrong. And you see, that is one of the things about the human race. Everybody has in them an internal moral code, a sense of right and wrong. You go anywhere in the world, people know it's wrong to take something that doesn't belong to you. Doesn't matter how primitive they are. They have a sense of knowing. It's wrong to hurt somebody else, to kill somebody, to, 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 to injure somebody. It's wrong to take something that doesn't belong to you. It's wrong to tell a lie. Everyone all over the world, they have this internal moral code. And, you know, uh, and, and if you treat, so even people who say, well, you know, there's, this is one of the things about the modern world today. There are no moral absolutes. But, if, but, but you cross them if you do something that's wrong, they'll say, now that's wrong for you to do that. You shouldn't treat me that way. Well, I thought you said there were no moral absolutes. So anyway, because everybody has this sense of right and wrong. I'll never forget in St. John, New Brunswick, I was working on the port. And I, I was assigned to work with a, with, with a fella. And, you know, there were some Christians that actually worked there. But uh, otherwise, there were some very wicked, foul-mouthed people that worked there. And I got assigned to work with a man. And I was working with him. And... Uh, so in talking to him, it came out, I told him I was a Christian and that I was a preacher and so on. And uh, he said something like, he said, well, that's nice. People need to be taught uh, the difference between right and wrong. And I said, people already know the difference between right and wrong. I started talking about this. He got angry and, and uh, belittled. No, people do not know the difference in right and wrong. So anyway, he was so angry. I just backed off. Okay, fine. Interesting. That was the only day that I was assigned to work with this guy. But then somebody told me, that just before this, just two or three days before this, he had been arrested at Kmart for ship shoplifting. <laughs> and you see how he was trying to justify himself. <laughs> My friends, it's very important. Live according to your conscience. Live according to that internal sense of right and wrong. Yes, your conscience can become informed as we grow in the Lord and as we learn His Word. There can, there can, we may find some things that we can do we couldn't do before. And then there may, we find there are some things we can't do anymore. Our conscience grows and our conscience becomes more and more informed as we walk with the Lord and as we study His Word. But the bottom line is, Paul says, God whom I serve with a pure conscience. My conscience is clear, Paul says. When I lay down at night, my conscience is clear. And my friends, that's a good way to go to sleep, with a pure conscience. Well, and if you have done something wrong, sincerely confess it to the Lord. Repent, confess it to the Lord, and say, God, forgive me. In John, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then, see, you can be back with a clear conscience. So verse 3, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy. Now, that I may be filled with joy is connected to uh, desiring greatly to see you. When I see you, he says, I will be filled with joy. And, uh, but he says, I remember you in my prayers without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers night and day. Now, remember, here's what I want to say to you. This is something I feel like the Lord just kind of dropped in my heart this afternoon as I was thinking on this that wasn't in my notes. This is for somebody tonight. When writing this passage, Paul did not have all the outward trappings that we think are necessary for successful praying. 
he was confined to, chained to, an ancient Roman cell, very possibly carved out of a rock, dark, no light, damp cell, uncomfortable, no comfortable bed to lie on. In other words, and this is what I'm writing in, in my devotional commentary that probably sometime next year will be in print. There is no comfortable soaking position that he can put himself in. There are no worship CDs that he can listen to to get him into mood, into the mood and usher him into the presence of God. He is in a dark, damp prison cell with only the bare necessities for survival. But what he did have was a pure conscience before God. God, it's down at the end, but I've done what I've known to do. I have served you to the best of my ability with all of my heart. He had a pure conscience before God. And he had a concept of prayer and of God's presence and a concept of prayer as simple conversation, just simply talking to God. Not some highfalutin religious ritual where a person changes their voice, our Father. <laughs> No, down to earth, talking to God. Reminds me of something in Charles Finney's autobiography. He tells about how that they're in one of the lumber camps uh, in the north. And this would have been probably in the 1830s, somewhere in there. There's a great revival broke out in, the, in these lumber camps. And, and these were just wicked people. They were uneducated. They were men who were out there working, you know, night and day as much as they could. And, uh, and this revival broke out, and many of them were coming to the Lord, and they didn't know anything. They'd never read the Bible before, didn't know anything. And anyway, one of them prayed in a, in a meeting a prayer like this. He said, um, uh, and, but this is just showing the simplicity of his prayer. He said, uh, Lord, you've had such, and this is one of these uh, lumberjacks that had gotten saved. And he said, Lord, you've had, and he prayed this in a public meeting. He said, Lord, you've had such good luck with me. I think you ought to try some other sinners. <laughs> so prayer is not highfalutin <laughs> religious rituals. Prayer is honest communication with God out of our hearts. And, and so Paul didn't have... <laughs> He didn't have all the religious trappings that sometimes we think we have to have to really have a successful prayer meeting in a prayer room. He turned his jail cell into a prayer room. And he said to Timothy, I am praying for you without ceasing night and day. Now here's what I wanted to share with you about this. Paul in his very unpleasant situation in prison and it's certainly not like prisons today there's no TVs there's no air there's no central heat and air in fact in this letter he tells Timothy to come quickly and he says bring with you the coat that I left in Tarsus and he says Timothy try to get here before winter Do you see how down to earth this letter is he says, Timothy, I need you to come quickly. Try to get here before winter and bring the coat that I left in Tarsus. It's going to get cold here, Timothy, and I need that coat here in this prison cell. But that prison cell has become a sanctuary, a prayer room, and a sanctuary. And in, and in your greatest times of crisis and your greatest times of feeling neglected, abandoned, of distress can be turned into a time of great communication and revelation with God. This is a passage, Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 14 and 16. I'm going to read this. And this is related to the children of Israel 
Many of them had been carried away captive because of the sins of the nation as a whole and had been carried away captive to foreign lands, to these Gentile cities, to these heathen cities, to these Gentile sinners. And Ezekiel said, and the people left in Jerusalem, they felt so sorry for these people out there because they were so far away from the Lord. And they felt compassion for them. And reading, and reading different, um, not commentaries, but translations of this, it's not clear in some cases as, if where the people in Jerusalem was saying, you know, we don't want you to come back. This is our possession. Or if they were feeling sorry for them that they were so far away from Jerusalem and therefore they were so far removed from the Lord. But listen to this, what the message God sent to those people uh, through Ezekiel. He says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, your brethren, your relatives, your country bed, and all the house of Israel in its entirety are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said. This translation says, Get far away from the Lord. Some translations say, or say You are far away from the Lord. In other words, talking about the diaspora. This land, that is Jerusalem, has been given to us as a possession. You are far away from the Lord. So just stay there far away from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles, although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I, sh I God said I, shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. <laughs> and I looked up that word sanctuary and it means a holy and a sacred place. And God is saying, yeah, they've been scattered out among the heathen and the Gentiles, but I myself will be a sanctuary for them. I myself will be a holy and a sacred place for them. Wow. And this, I thought of this. This is the story of a young African woman from Carthage in North Africa who was a martyr in the early 4th century. She and others were arrested for their faith. She was beaten. She was in her 20s. And she, had an, she was married. She had an infant son uh, that was still nursing. And she was arrested. She was beaten. Uh, she refused. She was given the opportunity to renounce her faith. She refused to do so. And then she was put in prison. She was very anxious for her infant son. And finally they allowed her to have her infant son in her uh, prison cell with her. But, but this is what is so interesting. This is what she said. goes right along with what God said to the children of Israel in, their he, in the heathen lands. I myself will be a sanctuary, a sacred, holy place for you. I am reading from uh, the writings of Tertullian, an early church father, and this is volume three of what's called the Ante-Nicene. Ante meaning before, that's Latin, before Nicene. Nicene is referring to the Council of Nicaea in 325. So the Council of Nicaea is sort of considered a landmark in church history. And so a lot of things are, 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 are dated before Nicene, after Nicene. So that's why this 10 volume set of writings are the Ante-Nicene Fathers, the leaders of the church after the first century, but before 325. And, um, and she talked about how she was languishing. And, um, and she said, I suffered for many days, but finally I um, obtained leave for my infant to remain in the dungeon with me. She calls it a dungeon. She's been beaten. She's been imprisoned. But then listen to what she says. I, actually, she and the others... In this story, this is from the 4th century, they had many powerful visitations of God. And um, I'll just tell you this one she had. And sometimes when we're in the greatest distress because of God's grace. I heard somebody, when I was a student in Bible school, <laughs> he asked a question. This is, now this is important, my friends. 
When I was a student in Bible school, way back in the 19, early 1970s, I don't even know who it was, a guest speaker uh, asked the students, how many of you uh, spent time in prayer this morning? Well, practically everybody. How many of you heard from God this morning? Well, not very many raised their hands. He said, I guess everything's okay then. Uh, and he wanted to make the point. God speaks often supernaturally when we really need it. And I heard Kenneth Hagin Sr. say many years ago, he said when God, and he was looking back on his life, he said when God has spoken to me supernaturally, it's always meant there was rough sailing ahead. In other, word, I, in other words, I was going to need that word, that visitation, to carry me through. So, she shares many incredible visitations and powerful visitations of God there in the prison. Why? Because they needed it. We have a friend, and one day I believe that you will meet Marie Brown. Marie Brown is an incredible single woman. She must be about 60 now, and we've known her since she was... Just the kid, as you would say. And uh, Marie, we, when we first knew her way back in the, I guess, the 1980s, she was smuggling Bibles into uh, the iron, behind the Iron Curtain, Eastern Europe. And uh, she still goes all over the world into China. And she was telling us about, yep, she goes all over the world. Anyway, she was telling us about talking to a, uh, a pastor who had been serving time in prison in China for his faith. And he said, I'm looking forward to going back. And she said, well, why? He said, I have never felt so close to God as I did during the time in prison. Well, why was that? Well, just because he needed it. He needed it to sustain him. My friends, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Where you have the greater challenges, you can expect the greater grace. But here's what this woman said. The divine ability, whatever it is we need to cope with the situation. But here's what this woman said after this, this young woman. Oh, I want to tell this story. She had a dream, or she may have called it a vision even. Perpetua. She has been inducted into the Hall of Fame. So her... Uh, uh, her induction is probably there on that website, Sue. You can listen to this. Very moving story. But she told about how she had this very vivid dream one night. Her brother came to her, who, who, who was still free. He came to her, and he asked her to pray and ask God if, if she, his sister, and others would be released or if they were going to have to. To, pay the to make the ultimate witness by laying down their life. So she said she prayed. And she said that night she had a very vivid dream that there was this ladder stretching up into heaven. And, uh, and she started to climb that ladder, but there was a dragon that came and tried to take her away, to pull her back. But she escaped the dragon and she climbed up and she climbed to the top of the ladder and she came into this beautiful meadow. It was so beautiful and she was, there was a shepherd there. And he said to her, welcome home, daughter. And she said when she awakened, she knew that she was going to have to lay down her life and, and pay the, make the ultimate witness with her life. And so she was in prison sometimes before this. But here's how she described her time in prison, in the dungeon, as she called it. She said, and the, and the dungeon became to me as if it were a palace, so that I preferred being there to being elsewhere. What's going on here? This is what God said to Ezekiel about all these people who have been scattered into these heathen lands and their brethren in Jerusalem say, oh, you're far removed from the Lord. God said, no, I myself will be a sanctuary for them. This is what happened to Jacob in one of the most distressful times of his life when he had to flee from his brother Esau. His parents sent him away. 
because his brother Esau was determined to kill him because Jacob had cheated him out of the birthright blessing. And so he's running for his life, going into a strange land. And the first night, and it's, it's a multi-day journey, and the first night he's in the wilderness, and he lies down in the wilderness, and he's got a stone for a pillow, and he's all alone. I'm not sure he feels very lonely. And that's when he had the dream of a ladder stretching from that place where he was sleeping out in the wilderness under the stars. And there were angels ascending and descending. And here he is running for his life all alone out in the wilderness. And yet God has become a sanctuary to him. And he awakened the next morning and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. And you know what he named it? Beth El. El meaning God, Beth meaning house. House of God. So right here in the place of my distress... God has become a sanctuary to me. Hallelujah. Somebody that will, either you're listening now or you're going to listen to it. You're in a place of great distress. And maybe other people think, and maybe you've even thought that, you're, that God is far away from you. No, no. Let your faith go out to God right now. This promise is for you. God will be to you there in your situation. This is what's happened to Paul there in prison. He doesn't have to go to a cathedral to be with God. God himself is Paul's sanctuary. And so Paul can intercede and he can pray for people out there without ceasing night and day. And so you in your place of trial in your place of distress let God pour out his grace upon you and let God himself become a sanctuary for you in that place of crisis and distress whatever it may be hallelujah yeah Sue please please share Uh, yeah, we could do that. Uh, Sue, I don't know if they heard you. Sue was just thinking of that song. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. That's what Jacob said. Hey, God is very close to you. I don't care what you've been through, what you're going through. God is very close to you. He will become a sanctuary for you right there where you are right now. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place I can feel his mighty power and his grace I can feel the touch of angel wings I see glory on each face and surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Would you sing it with me? And accept that that is true. That's what Jacob said when he awakened in the middle of the wilderness running for his life. Surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. Yeah, he's right there with you in your most distressful times. Sing this with me as a statement of faith. Well, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can feel the touch of angel wings. I see glory on His face. And surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Amen. So Paul says, read, let's read that again now. We're there in verse four, 3. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. 
is without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers night and day. Uh, Paul, Paul didn't have to have all the modern accoutrements. Now those things are nice. Oh, I love listening to really good worship music. And, and uh, I love wor Christmas time. Great Christmas hymns such as O come all ye faithful and uh, hark the herald angels sound. I love that. But you don't have to have that to enjoy the presence of God. Paul did not have all of those things because he knew this truth that in his most distressful, trying times, God himself would be a sanctuary for him. There's another course we used to sing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. I'm a saint. We're a, you are a sanctuary. We're a sanctuary. Then verse 5, he talks about, we read verse 4, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears. When did he see Timothy's tears? Maybe it was when Paul left him behind in uh, Ephesus because there's a great bond between the two. And I'm sure Timothy wasn't all that happy about dealing with all these problems in Ephesus all on all his own. But Paul is saying that he's desiring to see him that I may be filled with joy. Verse 5, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. It's a genuine faith that is in Timothy. It's the real deal. It's a real thing. Which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. See the impact of these women in the life of Timothy, his grandmother, and then his mother. There is no question that his grandmother and his mother, <laughs> how many grandmothers and mothers, <laughs> uh, that they have been the cause. They have been the influence in so many lives. And so Paul calls them by name. So they must have been they must have made an impression for, to Paul because Paul doesn't call a lot of people by their name. But he calls this grandmother and this mother of Timothy by their names. Lois and Eunice. And he says, I'm persuaded the same faith that was in them is in you as well. And then here, here it, we come to verse 6. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. Now, this must have been an issue with Timothy because earlier, I think it's in chapter 2, verse 15, in 1 Timothy, in an earlier letter, he told Timothy to not neglect the gift that was in him. And now he's telling him, uh, I'm reading New King James, to stir up the gift of God which is in you. Now, that word, the Greek word, I'm looking at it here. It is anazupurin, and it literally means to fan into flame. And when I read this, fan into flame, what I think of when I lived in Canada for eight years, and I'm sure Sue had this experience many times more than I did because that's where she grew up. But when we lived in Canada for eight years, we had a airtight wood stove and you could it was a large stove and you could put uh, stack wood in there and uh, get it burning and then you could turn this knob that would shut off the flow of air and it would just sizzle and crackle and burn all night and because it didn't have any oxygen or air there wouldn't be any flame but then this happened many times the flame would burn down the wood would burn down and there would, you'd only see ashes there. But underneath the ashes, there were still some embers. And I would get up, sometimes I'd use maybe a, a, a piece of plywood or something to fan the flame. I would open the door, fan the flame, or maybe just get my face up there and blow. And I remember different times how it would burst into flame. There would be a popping sound. It was like an explosion. There, there would be no flame or nothing there, but as I would begin to blow or begin to fan, all of a sudden those coals would begin to burn bright. They would get brighter, and then there would be an explosion, boom, 
and the flame would burst forth and there would be fire once again. And this is no doubt the picture that Paul has in mind that he's communicating to Timothy. And he perceives that Timothy has neglected the gift of God that is in him. First of all, the gift of God, starting, I don't know what gift he's talking about. Now, I believe that the one he's talking about here is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, all the other gifts reside in the Holy Spirit. The whole, I will say that again. All the gifts of the Holy Spirit reside in the Holy Spirit. That's why they're called the gifts of the Holy Spirit, manifestations of the Holy Spirit, because they all flow out of the Holy Spirit. And so he says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. Now, what is, what is the problem with Timothy? Now, remember, Paul did not write in chapter and verses. And so there's a gift in Timothy. I don't know for sure if Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit. He may be talking about some other gift that Timmy has been gifted with that he's He's just allowed for a reason we'll get to here in a moment, has allowed to die down, and it's like embers that are lying there. There is no flame. There's still life there. It still can be fanned into a flame, but it's not burning. There's no flame anymore. And so in this passage, uh, let me read what I've written here. This is a metaphorical picture of a flame that has burned down and now only a few embers remain. It can, however, be fanned once again into a new blaze of heat and light. This is what Paul is exhorting Timothy to do in regards to his spiritual gift that is lying dormant. Paul wants him to fan it into flame. You know, I would say that there are so many gifts of God that are lying dormant. And one reason is that we have a, a so, too much of a celebrity approach to Christianity. Whereas we have a few professional singers, a few professional worshipers, a few professional... And I know we like to involve people, but, but think about this for a moment. Men... So many people, and I would say the majority of people in the churches in America, they go to church and they are entertained. But really, the purpose of Christian leaders is to facilitate, to nurture, to facilitate, and to help people to begin to function and flow in the gifts that he has put in them. The word gift in this passage is a translation of the Greek word charisma from which we get charismatic. This is the gift that Timothy has allowed to go dormant. And it literally means grace gift. In other words, spiritual gifts are not given as rewards for achievement or good conduct. They say nothing of one's holiness or maturity. They are gifts given out of God's goodness and unearned favor. So don't try to earn God's gifts just by faith do what he choose, just receive by faith what he chooses to give. Now, I remember, I mean, let me tell you this, this, is, this can be helpful to somebody. I think this was 1994 is when my father passed away. My mother told me she wanted me to preach his funeral. And when I was thinking about it and what I would say, I felt, I, I, I just felt, I didn't feel up to it. I felt very inadequate and didn't feel up to it. And as I was praying about it, here's what I heard the Holy Spirit say. Just exercise your gift. In other words, that's all you have to do. Just get up behind the pulpit and just exercise your gift. I did. And it was a wonderful time. In fact, afterwards... I had a woman came up to me and she was actually my dad's niece, um, a little bit older than me. After the funeral, she came up to me and she said, I don't know if I should say this, but I really enjoyed this funeral. <laughs> but 
that was when I was feeling so inadequate to, 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 to fulfill what I'd been asked to do. This is what I heard God say, just exercise your gift. My friend, just exercise your gift. Well, I know a lot of people say, well, what is my gift? Well, we can get into that. Not so much tonight, but we can get into that. What do you feel passionate about? But here's a question you can ask. What do you feel passionate about? What would you like to do? What would you do if money was not an issue? What do you feel passionate about? What are you good at? What do you feel passionate about? But I want to get to, uh, before we close here, I want to get to the thing that was probably an, a problem for Timothy. Because remember, Paul didn't write in chapters and verses. So 6 and 7 flow right together. Verse 6, Therefore I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear, the Greek word is phobo, a spirit of timidity, of, of, a spirit of cowardice and fear. There are different indications that Timothy was maybe somewhat of a, that he wasn't a confrontational-like person, that, he didn't, that he, didn't, he didn't like confrontation because in 1 Timothy, where Paul is writing to him to encourage him about confronting the false doctrines, he tells him in, in I think it's chapter 6, to take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your often infirmities. So he has some stomach problems <laughs> and often infirmities. And we know today that stomach problems are often caused by stress and so on. So, uh, you know, it may be that Timothy does not like the situation that he is in there in Ephesus confront confronting false doctrine and that he's pulling back from exercising the gift of God that is in him. And Paul is saying to Timothy what the Holy Spirit said to me, Timothy, just exercise your gift. You can do this. I know that your, your, your natural personality is not inclined to this, but Timothy, you have a gift of God in this. And Timothy, if you will just exercise your gift, you can succeed in this mission. Now, that's some important stuff right there. Just exercise your gift. Well, why isn't he doing that? For God, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Timothy, that fear, that intimidation that's causing you to pull back and not exercise your gift, that's not from God. You know, there is a healthy fear of God, which is a reverence and an honor and an awe of the greatness and majesty of God, a respect. But the kind of fear that intimidates and makes you a coward and causes you to pull in and to pull back, that is not from God. And Paul says, Timothy... That spirit of fear is not from God. That spirit of intimidation is not from God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. Hallelujah. Everybody say power. <laughs> but God has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And the Bible tells us that, by the way, that the opposite of fear is love. And I have that here in this verse. John, 1 John 4, 8. There is no fear in love, and it's agape, but perfect love casts out fear. Now, you, somebody said, well, how can that be? Well, it's, it's, it's not the mushy kind of love you see on television today. By the way, it's not that. It's the New Testament agape love. Agape love was a, is a selfless love that's not focused on me. It's focused on the other person. And how can I do what is best for this other person? Agape is the kind of love that is willing to sacrifice its own self-interest. And if necessary, lay down its life for the sake of another. This is the love that God showed in the cross. It was agape. You want to look at Jesus hanging on the cross? That's a picture of agape. 
And there is no fear in agape because you see, fear is rooted in self, all concerned about me <laughs> and what's going to happen to me. And how's this going to pan out for me? But see, agape is not thinking about me. Agape, there was a song somebody wrote, I think it was, I um, uh, can't think of her, Dot, Dottie Rambo wrote, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. When he was on the cross, he wasn't thinking about him. He was saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he's concerned about others. And he sees his, he sees his mother Mary and his disciple and says, woman, your son, son, your woman, won't you look after him? John, won't you look after him? my mother? And God, forgive these people here. They don't know what they're doing. He wasn't, he, he, he wasn't about himself. He didn't have a victim mentality. God, get these people. <laughs> and John, you and Peter, you be sure <laughs> that you take revenge on the, no, 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 no. That was pure agape. The greatest demonstration of love the universe will ever see. Jesus on the cross. And there is no fear in agape because agape is not thinking about I, ego, and me. And that's why John says, 1 John 4, 8, that perfect love casts out fear because fear deals with I, with ego, with pride, and how's it going to affect me and what's, that, what's going to happen to me. And so that's why Paul also says, that was John 4, 8, that perfect love cast out fear. And so Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, intimidation, but he's given us a spirit of power and of agape and of a sound, disciplined mind. Wow, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now I'm going to close with this. God can give us unique ways to overcome fear. We all have to overcome fear, I guess. I don't know. I know different people have different issues and different, maybe based on, you know, your family background and how you raise, have different things that you have to deal with in life. But here's how God helped me to overcome fear. I don't know if it's the first year of our marriage, first one, two, three years. We've been married 43 years, so it's, this has been at least 40 years ago, maybe 41, 42. But we had started a congregation. We were in, in, new in the ministry for the first time together, and there's some situation that has arisen. I don't remember what it was, so it couldn't have been really uh, all that much. But anyway, it was intimidating me. It was, it, it was provoking fear and intimidation in me. And, uh, and it was causing tension and stress between Sue and I. So we drove down to the ocean, to the Bay of Fundy, and sitting there and talking about this. And as I'm sitting there, we're talking, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, now this is God giving me a personal way to deal with fear. And see, God can show you how to deal with things in your life. And if, this, if you can take this and use it, so be it. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to roar at this situation. And it was very real, so real. I said to Sue, God just told me to roar at this situation. And the only thing I could relate this was, was in the, the army, especially in basic training, that we were supposed, because it's an ex expression of aggression, assertiveness, we were supposed to be growling and roaring. Rah! I remember especially going through the bayonet course and where you going through all these simulated dummies and you got your rifle and your bayonet and you're supposed to be sticking them with your bayonet and hitting them with your rifle butt, but all the time, this was the command, you're to be growling, roaring, ah, ah. And uh, so this is what comes to my mind. This is the only thing I can relate it to. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I said to Sue, God just told me to roar at this situation. I'm sitting there thinking about this. And my Bible was on the dash. I wasn't looking for a scripture. I, I'm deep in thought about this. You know, like, how, how do I apply this? And I just happened to pick up the Bible and I laid it on my lap and I'm sitting there thinking. And then I happened to look down. And this is one of those, see, those providential things. I do not recommend, my friends, taking your Bible and uh, purposely open it and putting your finger and, and, and taking that as a word from God. Don't do that. <laughs> 
But God can, in His sovereign, providential ways, where you know you didn't make it happen, I looked down, and you know what I saw? My Bible had opened. Let me see if I have it here. Yeah, I have it here. My Bible had fallen open. I think it's Zechariah chapter 1. And I looked down and I saw the words, And the Lord shall roar out of Zion. Wow. Well, I knew God was speaking. And so what am I going to do? Well, the only thing I do is obey. Now, I did this. I didn't feel any stirring or motivation of the Spirit. I just did this in, out of obedience. So I pictured, so I sold soon. I said, I'm going to roar. So I pictured this intimidating situation in my mind, which today I don't remember what it was, but I pictured it in my mind. And, and to my natural mind, this seemed really silly. And if anybody was there watching, I'm sure they were wondering what was going on. <laughs> but I pictured it in my mind, and, I, I, and, and just like when I was in basic training, I picked mine and I said, Rah! <laughs> and I did it again, Rah! and lo and behold, that intimidation dissipated. It disappeared. Wow. And so I began to practice this in my own prayer life. Then I'd be, you know, when I'm having my own private devotional prayers, if something was was coming at me and trying to, if I felt intimidation or fear, I would roar at it. And I'll never forget, and I'll, I'll close with this, but this is, this is important, this can help you. A young man that I was roommates with at, at, in Bible school came up to, to visit us and he preached every night for a couple of weeks. Larry Hill had some very powerful meetings. And at this time, we were living upstairs in uh, where we were having church in an old, old uh, former uh, construction office building. And, and, and it, was, it was not a real nice neighborhood, and we'd seen some strange goings on around there. But one night, it was about midnight, uh, and maybe one o'clock in the morning, uh, we'd, we'd all gone to bed. Larry was in another room. We were in a room, and we heard this noise. It sounded like footsteps going down the hall. It sounded like a window sh slamming shut, and it was so obvious. I got up, and I went out in the hall, and Larry got up, and he came out, and I said to him, I said, were you up? And he said, no. He said, I heard all that noise. And he said, I was wondering if you all were up. And uh, so anyway, I thought, well, we had some uh, sound equipment and musical instruments downstairs. And uh, I thought, well, maybe uh, somebody has broken in. So I said, Sue, won't you go down and just check? See? No, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I went down these little narrow stairs. And here it is about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And it's dark. And I get to the bottom of the stairs. And, and, and this, these thoughts provoke, uh, that bring intimidation start coming to my mind. And I start thinking these thoughts. You're going to open the door and you're going to confront some people that have broken in and they're stealing stuff. And I felt this intimidation coming at me as I'm going down the stairs. But you see, I had learned how to deal with fear. And so when I got to the bottom of the stairs, I grabbed the doorknob and I jerked it open. And when I jerked it open, I jerked it open with a roar. I jerked it open and said, Aah! And I shouted at the top of my voice, Where are you, devil? <laughs> and I'll tell you again, it was amazing. All of that intimidation, it just went, whoosh, it dissipated. I don't know if there was anybody in there. If there was, they, they left quickly. But Sue and Larry came down. This is what was amazing. And we were standing, us, the three of us standing there. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon us. And we're standing there in the dark, no lights on, about 2 o'clock in the morning. And the three of us are standing there in God's presence, worshiping God. And a tongues and interpretation comes forth. <laughs> And if somebody had passed by, they would have wondered, what is this, these three people standing in the dark, worshiping God, speaking in tongues and prophesying? <laughs> but God said, I will be a little sanctuary to you. So my friends, don't let fear. Timothy apparently was a lying fear. Timothy needed to roar. 
roar at the devil. And one thing I learned, you know, the devil goes about as a roaring lion. He's not a real lion. He goes about as one. But I learned that on the inside of me is a real lion. He's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that you yourself, you are a sanctuary to us. Lord, even in our most difficult and distressing times and situations of life, you yourself are a sanctuary for us. Thank you for that, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. And we break every bondage of fear. We command every spirit of fear to depart and to go and to leave in Jesus' name. And I always do this because somebody may need to do what I did. And I, and I always say that you don't have to do what I did because that was something God used to help me. But I have found that other people have found it helpful. So I'm going to lead you in a roar. And especially if you've, been, if you've been attacked by a spirit of fear and a spirit of intimidation, I invite you to roar with me. I'm just going to count to three. And, uh, and we're going to roar. <laughs> hey baby it will straighten it all out so who knows so I'm going to count to three and if, if you again you don't have to do this it's, it's not any pressure to do it or not to do it I'm just, I'm just sharing you something that God showed me that has been very helpful to me personally and if you want to include it if you've been attacked by a spirit of fear I'm going to invite you to, to roar with me as I count to three one now, just picture that thing or person or situation or circumstance that is provoking fear in you, that's causing intimidation. Picture that in your mind right now. And one, two, three. Rah! 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 And the devil flees. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he flees from you. Some people have never seen the backside of Satan as he runs in terror. But when we, when we learn to roar at the devil and stand to our ground, walk in agape, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, you will see the backside of Satan as he runs in terror. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for everyone on this stream tonight. Lord, I pray now. Let's, let's, just, let's pray. Let's join. I know there's people out there watching, people of great faith. Let's pray. There's always somebody with this many people watching and who will watch the archives. Somebody need a, needs a physical touch. Let's pray right now for physical healing for people watching tonight. Heavenly Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus for physical healing for people. We know, Lord, that you came and you went about good healing all that were oppressed of the devil for, for God was with you. And you are, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, Lord, we ask you, and you